Amen, amen. Y'all can go ahead and sit down unless you want to stand during the sermon. <laughs> Be weird, but you could do it. It's all right. Glad you guys are here today. It's cold outside, but it's warm in here. The Holy Spirit's moving in our hearts and our minds, and so, so glad you guys are with us today. Hey, I'm always grateful for the thousands of volunteers that make Eastview Christian Church happen, uh, but this week I'm particularly, yeah, amen, right? This week I'm particularly grateful for the parking attendants and the door greeters and them being out there and doing a great job. I want to say thanks to them. And also, there's this guy that's been on our staff for uh, 24 years, as long as I've been here. His name is Larry Sands. You have no idea who he is, but he's always checking the systems of the air conditioning and the heating, and today I'm grateful for Larry Sands. We have heat in here today, all right? Eastview family, it's good to be with you. We're growing as Christ followers. We're learning how, what it means to be Jesus-like people, and we do that by following him and getting in the word. And if you're visiting here today, this is the place for you. Maybe you need a new start. Maybe you need forgiveness. Maybe you need a do-over. Maybe you need some peace in your mind. This is the place for you. If you're watching us online, we're glad you're here with us today. Same for you. Uh, I want to say hi to some of the people watching. Tracy from Toluca, Megan from Pontiac, uh, the Furmans from St. Louis, Carly from Lab and Sherry Kay from Fort Myers. God bless you all. I'm sure there's thousands watching today because it's cold outside. Uh, and so we're, we're glad that you're here. Some of you guys should have used your brains and come a little bit later. 11 o'clock, it's gonna warm up to nine o'clock, or nine degrees. So, you know, you could have done that. But no, we're tough. We're here at the three to three degree uh, hour. Anyway, uh, I, I'm so glad that you guys are here today. I want to draw your attention to one more thing before we get into Matthew chapter 24. Uh, this week is the Influence Conference, as you know, and every week when I, when I put out the notes for the sermon, I include a bunch of prayer requests. This week, I've listed all the speakers that are going to be with us this week on this stage, speaking to thousands and influencing us to be better influences. Will you just commit to me this week of praying for all those people? that will be here. Some of them are flying in from overseas. Some of them are coming from different parts of the country. Let's just pray and lift them up that God will do something special in this place. And I uh, hope you'll join me in that. Well, since the beginning of this decade, we have been talking about the kingdom coming. That's three weeks, by the way. <laughs> New decade. Humor in the first line that didn't work. Well, it's going to be a great sermon. Anyway, um, we're not talking about the kingdom coming as when Jesus came and said the kingdom is here. We're not talking necessarily about the kingdom coming that's in our hearts. The Bible teaches that to be true. I'm not talking about the kingdom come that we've been praying for for a year. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done through us and through the church in this world. I'm talking about the final conclusive kingdom come. That's what this whole series is about. The end of the world where Jesus forever kingdom is finally established and fully established forever and ever and ever. And we're talking about the end of the world. Now, when I say the end of the world, or what the Bible calls the last day, or the, the day of the Lord, what comes to mind? When I just say to you, I mean, just, you know, take off all your churchiness right now, just go, when I say to you, hey, it's the last day, what do you think of? Many of us probably have images, even if we haven't been in church, even if we don't know Bible very well, we have these images of the last day, right? People, there's going to be car crashes everywhere, right? You know, and fire hydrants blowing up and people running for their lives and screaming, tidal waves. The, the moon's gonna turn to blood. Stuff's gonna be happening in the sky. A cataclysmic, cosmic upheaval. Um, most of us understand this craziness that we picture in our minds on the last day. Many of our uh, opinions would line up with these three doctor theologians from New York in the 1980s. What will the end look like? It will be a disaster of biblical proportions real wrath of God type stuff. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies, rivers and seas boiling, 40 years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes, the dead rising from the grave, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. <laughs> That's from Ghostbusters. <laughs> if you're young and you don't remember that movie. Um, actually, most of the imagery that is found in the Bible is actually described in that movie. But we don't need to take Dr. Stance and Spengler and Vinkman's word for it because Jesus himself tells us exactly what that last day is going to look like and sound like and be like. And so that's what we're gonna look at today in Matthew chapter 24. We're starting in verse 29, three short verses that are packed with a lot of stuff today. So let's get to the word and then let God speak to us today. Matthew 24, starting in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened 
The moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. They will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today through his word. God, I pray that you would do what only you can do. By the power of your spirit, you can touch every person that's watching online. You can touch every person that's here uh, present in this place. Every heart that's disinterested, broken, wounded, needing mended, joyful, victorious. You can talk to all of us right now by the preaching of your word. And uh, so God, help me get out of the way. I don't want people to hear my voice or be impressed with words that I might come up with. I want them to see you, Jesus. Jesus, be lifted up. And as I lift up your name and as I point to that glorious day when you'll come back, would you, Holy Spirit, just, just move our hearts. Move our hearts and inspire us today. And if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Lord, may today be that day. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, so far, if you've been here all three Sundays this year, uh, on our journey, we've covered some pretty good territory. We've said that there's going to be birth pains that lead up to this final day, and we described some of those nations fighting against nations and all the turmoil in the world. And then last week we said there's going to be this abomination in the holy place and lots of tribulation on the church and the people of God. And today we come to that final day. So everything we've been looking at all to this point are a bunch of signs that lead up to this day. There's going to come a day when the world is over. Jesus says, uh, leading into this final day, verse 29, he's talked for 28 verses in Matthew uh, 24. And he says, immediately after the tribulation, then those days the sun will be darkened. He's talking about the final day. Remember we said that tribulation is a squeezing, a pressing, uh, an oppression of the people of God. And Jesus says immediately after that, the day of the Lord's going to happen. The last day. And according to Jesus, there are going to be unmistakable sights and sounds that come along with that coming kingdom. First of all, there's going to be a cosmic reversal. The first thing we notice at the end of the world is what I'm calling cosmic reversal. I call it cosmic reversal. I was going to say cosmic chaos, but it's not chaos. If you think about the, the creation of the world, it's a reversal of what's been uh, historic on the earth since the Lord began this whole thing. It's a reversal because when it's all said and done, the earth that God created is going to essentially go back to what it was before he created it. Now, you guys know the story. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, what did the earth look like? The earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. What, what existed here where we now stand, sit, whatever you're doing, uh, what existed here and now before God spoke it into existence? Darkness, void, nothingness, eternal darkness. And then Jesus spoke that word and he said, uh, let there be light. The first day there was light. You probably know this in the order of the creation. But on the fourth day, on day four, God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some, a lighting system in this world. And he threw up the, the sun. The sun was going to be the dominant daytime thing. And the, the moon was going to reflect that light and be the dominant nighttime. This is all in Genesis chapter one. And then he put all the stars in space. I was reading this week, did you know this? That the, did you know that scientists estimate that there are a hundred billion stars? A hundred billion stars, right? There's a lot of them. And they also estimate that there's a hundred billion galaxies. It's an amazing thing to me because science, which I always believe in science and Bible going together because when science gets to the end of all the discoveries, it's going to be God sitting there going, hi. And at the end of our universe, which we still haven't figured out yet, are all the limits of the stars. The Bible says that God threw the stars into place. The Bible says that God spoke the stars into existence. The Bible says that God spoke them into existence and commanded them to be, and he has a name for each of them. 
God is this amazing God that created the sun and the moon and the stars, and they have been lighting human history and this earth since day four. And they're going to light this earth until the last day. On the last day, Jesus says, the sun's going to be darkened. Now, I, I, this is not an eclipse. This is not a cloudy day. This is the sun is going to go out. This ball that's been holding us in existence through warmth and light for all these years is just going to be extinguished. It's going to be darkened. The moon will have no light because it's the reflection of the sun. You guys probably studied better than I did when you were in school. You know this. The stars will fall from the sky in the most incredible light display ever. You think you've seen a meteor shower or falling stars. There's going to come a day where everything in the heavens, all the lights of the heavens are going to be turned off. Flip the switch, it's over, and the stars are going to fall. Bible says in verse 29, the powers of heaven will be shaken, not stirred. I couldn't help it, I'm sorry. It's shaken, not stirred. It will, be, it will be incredible, cataclysmic changes in what we know to be the sun and the moon and the stars. Every established, visible, heavenly thing will be reversed. Peter confirms this in the first Christian sermon in Acts chapter 2. Peter quotes from the book of Joel in the Old Testament. He says, there's going to be wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoke and sun turned to darkness, moon to blood before the day of the Lord, that great and magnificent day, Acts 2, 19 through 20. See, throughout history, the sun and the moon and the stars, you probably know this, a lot of different traditions, a lot of different places, even today in this world, uh, people worship the sun and the moon and the stars. They worship the created thing, rather than the creator. But there's gonna come a day where even all these things that have been worshiped throughout creation wrongly, the sun, the moon, and the stars, will in the end bow down to God. The light of Jesus is going to outshine the light of the sun. The brilliance of Jesus is gonna throw shade on the moon's reflection, and the stars that were flung into space by Jesus' hands will humbly fall in worship at his presence. That's what's gonna happen. What's the last day gonna be like? Well, when you see the sun go out, ding, 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 it might be the last day. And then when all these things happen, Jesus goes on to say, and then we'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Note verse 30 says, then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then at the end of verse 30 says, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. If you don't understand churchy language, if you're not studying the Bible a lot, or you're just visiting with us today or watching us online and you don't know, you might be asking, well, what's the son of man? What's that mean? Well, son of man literally in the Greek language just means a boy born of a human. That's what it literally means, a son of a woman born in the natural way. But we see it capitalized here because in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel predicted that God was going to come in the flesh, the Messiah, the Christ, and he called him the Son of Man. Maybe you do, maybe you don't know this, but this is super intriguing to me. For all the names that we have of Jesus Christ, the name and the title that Jesus used for himself more than any other in the New Testament was Son of Man. Jesus pointed to the Old Testament Daniel prophecy and said, Son of Man back there, that's me. And he called himself the Son of Man. So what we're really seeing here is that the, in heaven will appear the sign of Jesus, and Jesus will come on the clouds of heaven. Now, many of you might be uh, drawn to that word there. What's it mean? What's the sign of the Son of Man? That, that word uh, can be used to, to, to describe a lot of things. It describes miracles in the Bible a lot, um, but it deeply means a mark or a token or an indication, and it can actually mean a standard or a flag. It signifies something. It's a symbol that signifies something. So what is the sign of the Son of Man? This is stuff that theologians geek out about. They're like, oh, wow, what is the sign? And a lot of people, especially early on, they guessed it was going to be the cross. There's going to be this huge, awesome cross in the sky. And again, that's not a bad guess because Jesus obviously did his greatest work on the cross. But I believe when Jesus comes back, the cross would be the wrong symbol because he's done the work of the cross. He's laid the cross down. Jesus doesn't need the cross anymore. He already laid that down, defeated sin and death through his death, burial, and resurrection. So I'm not sure it's going to be a cross, a big you know, neon cross in the sky or however God wants to trick that out. Some people think it might be a banner. Like when... 
generals and, and uh, warriors and kings went into war in the olden days and they had banners and standards that said things like King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Some people think it's gonna be this huge Jesus banner like at the base basketball games, right? Jesus is here, I don't know. Uh, it could be, Revelation 19 paints a picture of Jesus as the conquering king on a white horse, on his robe and on his thigh are written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Could be that kind of majestic charge with a banner that leads the way. But I land where most Bible students land. The sign is Jesus. So you should read it this way. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man. The sign is Jesus. Suddenly everybody's gonna recognize him. Everybody's going to know. Why are they going to know? Because look, he's gonna be coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There's something about eternity when it, hap when it happens, when this last day comes, Jesus is going to appear in the clouds and nobody's going to go, who's that? Everybody's going to suddenly know this is God, Jesus, coming to take his people home and they're going to understand it clearly. We'll get to that in just a moment. This coming on the clouds thing is deeply entrenched in Christian understanding. A little bit later towards Easter uh, this year, we're gonna study about Jesus' final week and we're gonna get to the trial in Matthew 26. Do you remember it? When the high priest looks at Jesus and says, are you the Christ, tell us, stop goofing around. And Jesus says, you have said so. And from now on, you're not gonna see me again until you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. In other words, the next time you see me, I'm, it's gonna be too late for you. I'm going to be coming in the clouds in triumph and victory and glory, the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Jesus says it. In Acts chapter 1, you remember that story? Another great story in the Bible. Jesus has given his great commission in Acts 1. He says, y'all are going to be my witnesses, Judea, Jerusalem, the uttermost parts of the world. I'm sending you go. And then Jesus goes up into heaven. The Bible tells us in a cloud. I don't know how that looked or how that was, but... I don't know if it was five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, two hours later, all the people that watch Jesus going up in the clouds are going, huh, what are we supposed to do now? You're supposed to go. He said, I'm sending you. And he actually had to, okay, angels, go down there and tell them. An angel had to come down and tell them. Stop, stop looking up into the sky. Jesus is going to come back in the same way. He's going to come in the clouds of joy, uh, of glory. Now go and do what he's asked you to do. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says that we who are alive will be caught up with him in the clouds. You ever ride in a cloud before? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, someday you're going to. That's going to be sweet. We will all see this someday, but there's also a distinct sound the sun, moon, and stars do their thing. They bow down and worship to God. Jesus coming in a cloud and power and great glory is a sign that we'll all understand. And then we're going to hear something too. This is very biblical, very New Testament. The last day, the coming of the Son of Man will be marked by a trumpet blast. That's what it says there. With a, the, uh, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. You can't find a return of the Lord in the Bible without a trumpet being involved. In fact, there's two very famous passages. You've probably heard them if you've been to funerals, but they're very important because they talk about resurrection in the Christian life. If you want to know about resurrection and all things next life, you should read 1 Corinthians 15. Paul explains most of it there. But in 1 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, in 1 Thessalonians 4:16, he says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. And, and, and Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in the twinkling, twinkling hey, wah, hey, try some English here. My tongue was cold. This is a very cold day, I'll say. Uh, for in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. There's going to be a trumpet on the last day. I've heard trumpets. They're very loud. Very, you can't mask that sound. It's a very loud and dominant sound in music. I cannot imagine what the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound like. Everybody's going to hear it. Everybody's going to see the sun, moon, stars, Jesus coming in the clouds. Historically, in the Bible times, especially in the history of the Old Testament people of God, we find the trumpet was used primarily for three things. Okay? Uh, first of all, the trumpet always uh, was a call and a charge into battle. 
You get all your troops together. If you have a war and enemies coming, you blow the trumpet so all the troops will assemble. Then when you get organized, you blow the trumpet. Let's go. The trumpet was also used if you went out to war and you had victory and came back, you announced the trumpet, victorious, we won. A trumpet was also used in the Old Testament and the old times to announce an important arrival of a high official or king. The reason I believe that Jesus is announcing his return with a trumpet is because all of those things are true. He is coming as a conquering king and hero. His army is being led from heaven as described in Revelation 19 to conquer and final judgment. And he is the king of kings and lord of lords. He needs a trumpet announcement for this thing to happen. Amen? Wow, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know if you guys are or not. It's like, my brain's cold, but that's cool. <laughs> Jesus says there are gonna be signs and events that lead up to a second coming that may be hard that will not be hard to recognize or identify. But when that day comes, it's gonna be obvious. It's gonna be like we said, the lightning in the sky. It's gonna be like when you see buzzards circling around, you go, there's a dead body. It's gonna be obvious, everyone will see it. And that leads us then to the most important question of today's Bible teaching. And really, uh, whether it's stated plainly or not, is the most important question of every sermon you ever hear. The art of preaching is sometimes answering this question without act act actually asking it, but today I'm going to state it plainly. Everything I've just described for you, whether you're a believer, a non-believer, visitor, church member, watching online or here live, here's the question. Everything I've just described, so what? So what? Why does this matter to me in 21st century McLean County, the life that I live, the high school I go to, the job that I work at, the place where I uh, hang out with friends? Why does it matter so what about the final day and, it's, and, and, and all the signs that will come with it? Here's the thing about the final day. It's final. The big so what is, it's final. And when that day comes, it's no longer earth time, it's no more, we have another chance time. When that final day comes, the day of the Lord, when the Lord returns, it's beginning of eternity and everything from that point on is eternal. When this day comes, you and I, believers and non-believers, People that have been dead for centuries and millennia, unborn babies, Muslims, Hindus, uh, Christians, Buddhists, atheists, every one of us, you, yes, you, every one of us will face eternity when this day happens. It's the final day. It's the last earth day. The question then becomes, is what's going to happen to us as a result of this last earth day. There are going to be two and only two eternal results. Everybody here will either begin mourning or be gathered into eternity with Jesus. Those are the two options. I know we like to have three choices, four choices. There are no, when that day happens, everything I've described for you today, when it happens, you'll see it in the sky, you'll hear the trumpet. When that day happens, it's final and we enter into eternity and that's it. There are two eternal results. You'll either begin mourning or you'll be gathered into the glory of Jesus Christ. You see what it says there in verse 30? I'm not making this up. This is the words of Jesus recorded by Matthew. <sighs> appear the sign in the heaven, the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They'll mourn. This is deep wailing. This is deep uh, regret. Uh, in fact, most of the time, uh, all the, the places I've heard uh, describe this word in the Greek language, it goes with an action. Here's the proper action, this wailing and this mourning. Because it is such incredible grief that I missed it. Now we're talking about the tribes of the earth here. Some people think it's a reference to the Israelite tribes and, and those who didn't see the Messiah that came from their people and from the, the history of Abraham. It could be that, but I think it's broader than that. Um, it, it, the tribes of the world, every nation, every descendant of every people group in the world, and they are going to mourn, and they're going to mourn because they're going to recognize the one that they ignored. 
They're going to recognize the one that said someday. They're gonna recognize the one who they rejected or denied or they fought against or didn't believe in, but now they realize who he is. Jesus is God, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he's come in power and they will see him and they will react in mourning. And I believe that will be verbal. Along with the trumpet, you're going to hear people wailing because they missed it. Every non-Jesus follower will let out a collective cry. Revelation 1-7, where John, um, the, the, uh, the apostle, says after his vision of heaven, behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail, same word as mourn, on account of him. Everybody who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is going to enter into this time of wailing. The second thing that's gonna happen that you're gonna hear is confession. Every non-Jesus follower is going to worship. Philippians 2 tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. How, what, what knees? Every knee and every tongue confess. How many tongues? Every tongue. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't know if you were here today and you didn't feel like worshiping and singing songs of joy and glory to the Father. I don't know if you participated. Don't know if you don't believe it. Don't know if you don't feel it. Here's what I know. Someday your tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the way it's going to be. And, uh, and so... If you're here today and you're not one that knows that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, here's what I'm telling you. Someday you're gonna be on your knees and declare what we've declared today along with every breathing thing in this creation that Jesus Christ is Lord. And unfortunately at that point, according to the teaching of the word of God, it's gonna to be too late. So here's your so what. Don't miss everything of the future for the nothing of this world. This is what I'm telling you about this last day. And maybe you're gonna to get to heaven someday and go, well, I didn't know, I didn't know. Yes, you did know. You know right now, I'm telling you today, this day is coming and you know it. Don't be caught worshiping by default. Don't be caught confessing by default. Don't be caught wailing and weeping because you missed it. Now you might be sitting here saying, hey pastor, you're scaring the children. This is really intense. I know it's intense. It's the end of the world. It's over. This is the last day. The kingdom has come eternally. And so for every, with every prayer and passion that I can muster today, I'm asking you at home, I'm asking you here all the way up to the balcony to the very front row, if you're not ready, would you come to faith in Jesus Christ today? Would you make him your Lord and Savior? There is still time, but time is running out. Uh, how do I know time is running out? Well, look in verse 29. You see that first word, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And you might be thinking, well, Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. It's not very immediately. It doesn't seem quick. It's not exactly immediate, immediate in our minds. I'll be... Uh, the first one to agree with you in that, but in God's world, remember the Bible describes for God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. In other words, in eternity, there is no time. God doesn't measure by our calendar. He doesn't, he's not going, oh, it's January 2020. That's not how he measures time. He is the, he is in the eternal now, always. But someday, Jesus says in earth time, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he is going to return. And so what I'm saying to you is, if he was saying immediately 2,000 years ago, how close do you think we are now? It's closer, according to Paul in Romans 13, 12, the night is far gone and the day is at hand. And my plea for you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, is won't you come today? and join those of us who will have this other result when the Son of Man comes. We will be gathered, his, he will gather his elect from the four winds. He'll gather his elect from the four winds. This is the promised and glorious eternal event for those of us who have been chosen people of God through the grace of Jesus Christ and by our faith in him. 
The angels will gather the elect from the four winds. What's the four winds? Just another word for central Illinois. <laughs> Just. Actually, it's, it's an all-encompassing expression. The north and south and east and west, all the winds for all the earth, for all time. He's gonna send his angels, nobody will be left out. All the chosen, the elect people of God will be brought to be with him forever. And this end of the world will happen and we'll be a part of it. There's some end of the world scriptures I wanna encourage you with today. Scriptures that give us details that, that tell us what this will be like. Cause we look at this and go, well, what's that, what's that gonna be like? Angels are like swooping down and grabbing us and take, well, we get some other insights. First Corinthians 15, again, something you should absolutely read if you're concerned. First Corinthians 15 tells us that we will all be changed in an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We will all be changed and we will listen to this. We will receive new bodies. Yeah, all you granola eating workout people, <laughs> we get to heaven, you're gonna look like you're just like he ate donuts his whole life, and I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> but we will be, we'll receive new bodies, imperishable ones that will never decay, and death and sin will be defeated, and it will no longer sting, it will no longer hurt, because it will no longer be a reality. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 says, that we're gonna receive these incredible new bodies. 1 Thessalonians says the dead in Christ will go first. So we're gonna see the sun, the moon, the stars fall, son of man coming in the clouds, and people that we have prayed for and lost, and people that we love, grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles, they're gonna go flying by us. It's gonna be pretty wild. <laughs> because they're gonna to rise to meet him in the air, and then the Bible says if we're around, then we too will rise to meet Jesus in the clouds. This is why there's an old church song that I sang when I was growing up in church. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. You ever want to fly? Well, stay tuned. You're going to. That's what the Bible teaches, that you will rise to meet him in the clouds, that we'll fly away. This kingdom coming, end of the world moment is something that we as Christians should be looking forward to. But there's still two so what's that I want to share with you at the end of this sermon for those of us who are followers Number one, I want you to be encouraged. I know that your world feels like tribulation sometimes. And I know that you're impatiently waiting for God to get you out of here. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 says that when he explains all this last day stuff and the trumpet call and the people of God raising to be with him in the air, the Bible says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So church, Christians, be encouraged today. This thing that we've staked our lives and our eternities on is gonna happen. And when it does, he's gonna get us out of here. But there is more for Christ followers to do than be glad that we're in and just wait around till we get our wings. When we talk about the final coming of Jesus on that day, it should be a wake up call for us. Really what I'm kind of leading into is what I'm gonna say at the influence, another Speakers are gonna say at the Influence Conference this week, if the final day of Jesus is coming, then we need to wake up, live different. Paul challenges in that same verse I quoted a little bit of earlier in Romans, the hour has come for us to wake up from our sleep, for salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. And the day is at hand. And if anything you've heard today is true, then today could be the day. You think you're gonna get lunch, go see your kids, get ready for tomorrow's work, watch a football game, take a nap, and all of a sudden the sky is split open. Could be tomorrow. Going to your routine, going to your classes, going to your work, answering your emails, and then the sky split open. And here's the question, if Jesus is coming, and it could be today, or it could be tomorrow, how different would you live now? Who would you talk to? Who would you need to have a conversation with? 
what would be your activities of this day if Jesus comes back today or tomorrow? Well, maybe we should wake up from our complacency. Stop worrying about our stuff. Start focusing on things above where our, our lives are seated at the right hand of God. The kingdom's coming as I've described it today. But until it does, we've got kingdom work to do. Amen.